Uh, with foreign leaders being in power for decades to even a lifetime, and with the presidency in the United States being changed out every four to eight years, how do you effectively deter and combat a foreign entity when they could essentially just wait it out for a president who is much more lenient on foreign policy? Because yeah. four to eight years compared to a lifetime is a drop in the bucket. Sure, that's, that's a good question. So there's, there's benefits and there's disadvantages to having term limits. I think the benefits far outweigh the negatives. Um, let me kind of give you a very obvious one. Um, if you have a really bad leader, you should have a way to get rid of that leader, right? That's Chrissy in our country, right? We just have kind of different people that come in to try to manage it. Does that make sense? Where it's like, we have, we, yeah, we have a new president, but the FBI doesn't change. Like, DOJ doesn't change. The IRS doesn't change. Um, and look, I, I will say this, that, you know, <laughs> there's, there's a, a, a temptation to be like, oh, yeah, a dictator could just fix these problems. They can wave a wand. I know that's not what you're saying at times. But um, I think that we need to do everything we possibly can to resist that, that separation of powers um, and believing that a single person should not have the dominance over the many, that the many need to rule the few, the few should not rule the many, um, is something that will actually allow the civilization to survive a lot longer than the Potemkin village of the Chinese Communist Party. So CCP or Saudi Arabia or Iran or Russia might be able to wait it out, but they're actually sitting on a much more, um, I would say, uh, destructive set of circumstances because I do not believe dictatorships are sustainable long term. I don't. Um, I think they can be passed down, but eventually there'll be fault lines, divisions, civil war, and hopefully a citizen-led movement to displace them. So thank you. I appreciate it. Hi, amazing viewers. Welcome back to my YouTube channel. So if you are new here, please subscribe to my YouTube channel. So today I'm reacting to Charlie Kick, debate college student at California State. So guys, you know the way I love reacting to Charlie's video. So please let's watch this wonderful video with me. Poof! Um, I was wondering if you could give some encouraging words to students who are being alienated by teachers, their communities, and their friends um, because of their Christian or conservative values. That's a really important question. So uh, students there, raise your hand if you think you've been graded differently or treated differently because of your beliefs. Yeah, basically every hand goes up. So um, that's right. Marco says worth it. Um, yeah, look, I want to say this. So there's a, uh, there's a disagreement on the right. Um, and I have, I have a lot of respect for Ben Shapiro, but he has a different answer than I do on this, and I'll kind of say this. So, uh, Ben, and this is not precisely your question, but I'll incorporate it. So the question, here's the question. Do you lie on your term paper or how you present yourself to your professors to get a good grade? That's a question a lot of people ask, right? It's like it's easier to kind of hide and to not confront things. So Ben says, yes, uh, lie, misrepresent your beliefs, get the good grade, and get through college or high school. Um, I see it differently. Um, I do not believe getting a good grade is nearly as important as creating strong people filled with integrity, willing to fight for truth uh, at all. And so, now why am I bringing this up? Um, because if you, if you wanted to kind of, those of you that are conservative wanted to have an easier life, then just pretend to not be a conservative and just keep your head down and, you know, just pretend to be something that you're not and delete your social media. I think there's a lot more important things in life than that. So the word of encouragement is this. Uh, first, something that is true uh, that you don't want to hear, and then something that is true that you probably will want to hear. Um, it's never going to stop. You will be harassed, called names, demonized, uh, victimized. Uh, you will be smeared and slandered. Uh, you will lose a lot of your friends, um, and you'll doubt whether it's all worth it. Sound fun, right? Well, here's the second thing, though. You will be a stronger, tougher, more resilient person that will look around at your peers one day while they're worried about whether or not they're being called the right pronouns. And you will be, you will have your direction, you'll have resolve, you'll have a intestinal fortitude, you'll have gusto that will run circles around an increasingly fragile society and you will have what is so lacking in America today, grittiness and toughness. And that is something that I want to instill in every single young person. So yeah, it's gonna to be tough. We here at Turning Point USA are here to help you get through that through our networking events, through our Young Women's Leadership Summit, through our chapter events, through the events like this tonight, so you know you're not alone. But we want to try to continue to rise up the citizen of young people and students to be able to take a stand. But it's going to be tough, but it's worth it. God bless you. Thanks for being here tonight. 
Hi, Charlie. My name is Jared. I'm the president of the Turning Point chapter at your Belinda High School. Awesome. Um, so last week on April 5th in a 3-2 vote, my school board passed a resolution to ban critical race theory in my district. So my question is, what's the next steps to ensuring that we have a good education even after that ban? Yep, that's great. So it's a two-part dance. Um, so that's great. Now you need to say, okay, let's get pro-American curriculum in our schools. So what does that look like, right? Um, Hillsdale College has done a lot of work in this. Uh, we're starting to do a lot at Turning Point USA. But we have to teach people, what is the American story? What is the, prop, what is the proper way to view American history? What is America? Was it a mistake? Was it something that just kind of fell out of the sky? There's just a couple things I'll share here that I think could really excite high school students that they're definitely not taught in school. Um, America was summoned into existence at a time and a place. That is very unusual. In fact, it's almost never happened before in human history. Most civilizations or countries stumble into existence. They're not summoned into existence. I want you to think about that. There was a decision to create America. China just kind of existed and, you know, it was kind of the Yangtze River Valley civilization and just kind of built into itself. Indus River Valley into India and so on and so forth. But America was a group of people that made a decision, founding fathers, we have a set of principles, we don't like what's happening, we're going to declare independence of things that are always true. And I'm afraid that most young people are not just being taught that even worse, they're being taught the opposite. They're being taught that the founding fathers were racist, bigoted slave owners. And they don't know their history. They don't know that the first anti-slavery convention in America was hosted in Philadelphia by Benjamin Franklin in 1775. They don't know that 9 out of 13 states before the Constitution was ratified in 1787 had already independently abolished slavery. They didn't, a lot of young people were never taught that Vermont was the first state to abolish slavery in 1777, inspired by the Declaration of Independence. So the next step is get your local school district to not just teach this, but inspire young people to be excited about the country they live in. Um, a lot of young people, I think, are unnecessarily depressed um, and negative about their life because they've been told the one thing that you have a yearning to associate with your country is awful. Deep down, I think most people actually want to support their home. And you kind of see that when you start to see like a Dodgers hat here and like a Rams hat here. Like that's a different way of kind of showing association that you care about where you're from. Yet the one thing they're trying to get rid of is the jersey of America. Like, and it, th that's something I think that excites people. It creates happier lives. It creates stronger communities. When all of a sudden you're like, you know what? I, in Amer here in California, have a direct connection to a time where people decided to say that self-government was a moral issue. And that separation of powers and consent to the government was, is worthy of protection and preservation, and they were willing to do something about it. I think that actually creates a much happier country to live in than one where you think everything is racist, bigoted, awful, colonialistic, homophobic, and backwards. At some point, that only way you could solve that question is to revolutionize the country, and that's what they're trying to get young people to do. It's like if all that buildup was nothing but evil, then you might as well just burn it all down to the ground. So we as conservatives, and to answer your question in your Belinda, the home of Richard Nixon, if I'm not mistaken, right, um, is, uh, is to do this, which is to say to your local school district, we want to create a curriculum that creates grateful and informed citizens and an informed sense of patriotism. That is not political. That is essential to the survival of the country. Thanks for being here tonight. God bless you. Hey, Charlie. My name is Jonathan. I go to Casa Fullerton. I guess I have a simple question. Um, like in a family full of like conservatives, we're kind of the minority in the in a grand family. I just want to know how I can converse with the rest of my family being like liberal, and especially my friends as well, um, without obviously causing discourse and too much hurt. I guess. Yeah. Um, well, never be the source of hurt. That's my first piece of advice. So don't be the one to call names or you know um, try to disassociate from people, but. I think every conservative here in this audience would agree that you lost friends, but they left you. You didn't leave them. Uh, a lot of, and that's, I, I never support the severing of friendships over politics, but I'm also realistic. It happens all the time where people stop being friends with you because of politics. I bet every single person in this room could resonate with that. So look, this is a, this is a situation where you're going to have to balance. Are you going to tell the truth when there might be a consequence to it, right? And, it's also how you say it. It's also how you communicate it. Having that balance of 100% grace with 100% truth, trying to be magnanimous in how you communicate, I think is really, really important. But also, um, you know, 
understanding that in family dynamics, um, there you have to prioritize whether or not you want the family to kind of stay together or whether or not you want to make a political point. And I don't say this advice lightly. There's some politics that should, there's some families that should never discuss politics. Um, and there's an argument for that. It's like they're so rigid in their beliefs, it's just going to cause a civil war. Now, some people say, you know what? I'm going to, you know, say what I want to say. And I know personally dozens of examples of parents that don't talk to children anymore. I think that's really unhealthy. I think it's not good at all. Um, but it's a balance. I think that everyone should know where you stand. Um, and then the final piece of advice is go to work on the family members where there's a little bit of openness. If you believe that you're right, if we believe we're right, then start to send articles, ask questions, start to understand their, you know, their points of where they think that they view the world in a certain way. Like, well, I just want to help people. Like, okay, then start to find things where all of a sudden left-wing policies are not helping people, right? Like, how exactly does it help people when the border's wide open and women are being sex trafficked across there every single day? How does that help people? exactly and start to ask those questions but um and then with your friends i mean i kind of answered that already just um you know you're probably going to lose friends and they'll probably continue and uh, also know the difference between good faith arguments and bad faith arguments do not waste your time in bad faith arguments just don't if people are just putting their hands in their ears saying i don't want to hear anymore just disengage but if people are really curious and they're dialoguing with you that's worth your time but don't waste your time you, you and you could use your own prudence and your wisdom to navigate that thanks for being here tonight appreciate it Hi, Charlie. So my name is Max Mickelson. I'm the chapter president of Orange County School of the Arts, uh, Turning Point chapter. And um, thank you. That's like a radical right wing university, right? <laughs> so earlier this year, as you may have heard from my friend um, Alex LaRusso, ALX. Yeah, sure. Uh, we were, we were, we, I started a chapter there. We were egged, harassed, vandalized, um, had basically threatened attacks from administration, all kinds of things. Um, so uh, I kind of have a two-part question. First question is, uh, uh, do you think Elon Musk will free Alex? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, ALX is banned from Twitter. I think so. If Elon you know, sorts this out, I support that, and hopefully he'll free me too. So. <laughs> Thank you. And my more serious question is, um, what's your message to, I'm always trying to recruit people to the chapter, and uh, a lot of the response I get is, oh, I don't want to be harassed. I don't want to lose friends. I don't want to be egged, basically. Um, <laughs> And uh, so what would be your message to people who believe in conservative ideas, want to get involved, but I guess don't want to uh, suffer the backlash that comes with it? Yeah, that's, I mean, it kind of goes to the first question, right, which is you're going to get it, it's worth it, hold the line, uh, and strengthen your resolve. Um, I would love to go speak at one of these art schools, um, and I'll tell you why. Um, the left has destroyed art in our country in a way that I don't think we can actually appreciate. And I... Um, this is kind of like one of my kind of, you would say, kind of like unexpected kind of focuses. Um, I think that our society has become so aesthetically ugly the more the left has taken things over from architecture to what we consider to be art to music to dramas to this garbage they call, you know, television at night. Um, and so I believe art should try to strive towards the divine, the beautiful, the good and the true. Um, there's two rules in architecture that used to exist in Western society. Um, you should try to have buildings that point upwards to God, um, and the circle is the perfect shape because it has no beginning or end, uh, just like God. Very two simple rules. Um, we get away. You just look at Western architecture now. It's just an amalgamation of like the, the very same deconstruction, de deconstruction ideology that we're seeing um, right now. And so there's a, one of my favorite people to follow. He passed away recently. Is Roger Scruton. He was amazing. He lo talked a lot about objective beauty, and it also talks about more fundamental things, which is do we believe there are such things as objective standards? You didn't ask anything about this. I'm just you know kind of riffing on it, um, but. I'm sure you love it, but that's what's so interesting is that actually where these discussions are the most robust um, is in the art school, right? So the question is, do you believe like a signed urinal is art and beautiful? This was a question in the 1920s. I can't remember. Uh, yeah, that's exactly right. Du Duchamp, that's right. Marshall Duchamp, where he signed a urinal. I don't think that's art. I think that's, a, you know, a place to, you know, relieve yourself. Um, but that was considered to be art. Uh, and I think that's actually directly connected to a lot of the philosophical deconstruction that we're living through right now, right? If all of a sudden, you know, art is nothing more than what your own opinion of what is beautiful, well, then why can't you also have all these kind of other societal cancers all of a sudden start to infect every single portion of American society? So 
Um, okay, so what do you say to friends that don't want to get involved? Look, you can only push them so far, but it's all about leadership. It really is. And so if you're the leader, you know, you're going to have to say, hey, I'll take the hits for you. Just help me out. Try to be part of it. And so there's, there's two types of people. You could be a George Washington or you could be a John Hancock. George Washington went right into battle, stared the bullets in the eye, and went straight into there. John Hancock, of course, we know he signed the Declaration. No mystery he was involved, but he never wore a uniform of the Continental Army and was the number one financier of the effort. There's people that are the fighters and the people that help the fighters, and both are equally important. So if people are afraid to get involved, be like, hey, can you be a covert graphic designer for our Turning Point USA chapter? Something would tell me you guys would probably come up with some of the coolest memes in the world at, at your school. So um, there's a lot of different ways to get people involved, but you as a leader are the most important thing. We have a crisis of leadership right now in our country. George S. Patton had a great quote, which is, lead, follow, or get out of the way. Um, and leadership is hard. But a lot of people think they want to be leaders, but in reality, they just want the perks of leadership. right? They want the corner office, the Instagram followers, the chauffeured car, but they don't really want to work till 2 a.m. on a Sunday morning to go reach a deadline, make payroll, borrow money, fire, hire people. They don't want to have to do that. Um, leadership is hard, but it's necessary. Uh, because it requires you to take responsibility. A leader is someone who does not point any fingers except in themselves when things go wrong. Um, and that's what you're doing at a, as a Turning Point USA chapter leader. So God bless you, man. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Wow. Charlie. <laughs> oh, Charlie, like, I just, I just enjoy, I, I really... I enjoyed his uh, talk show, his speech, the way he talks. I just, I like the way he educates people. Sometimes, you know, I learn a lot when I'm reacting to Charlie's video. Like, he is good. I don't know if you have learned a lot of things in this uh, um, talk, um, answering a talk show like this. I don't know if you have learned too. Because me, I'm learning a lot day by day from charlie like do you know what he said he said leader is someone that uh we take the blame to himself without involving any other people wow yeah because some people want to speak out they want to talk they want to like like say their mind but they are scared to lose friends to lose business associates to lose um different people so they are really really scared so that's the reason why when you are scared like this, but you have a good point, you have you know what to say. You just have to look for someone that is um, on top, someone that is bigger than you, that is outspoken, that believe that they have the same vision with you. So that maybe if you cannot talk, you can share your opinion with that person. Yes, like Charlie is good. I just cannot wait to. Um, watch more of this 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 video because the video is a little bit long and I like it because I want to learn a lot and please also calm down and learn with me so let's continue um, hello Charlie Kirk my name is Michael a student here at uh, CSU Fortin and a member of the TPUSA right. club at Fortin and thank you very much for coming out I greatly um, enjoyed the speech anyway so my question uh, with foreign leaders being in power for decades to even a lifetime, and with the presidency in the United States being changed out every four to eight years, how do you effectively deter and combat a foreign entity when they could essentially just wait it out for a president who is much more lenient on foreign policy? Because yeah. four to eight years compared to a lifetime is a drop in the bucket. Sure, that's that's a good question. So there's there's benefits and there's disadvantages to having term limits. I think the benefits far outweigh the negatives. Um, let me kind of give you a very obvious one. Um, if you have a really bad leader, you should have a way to get rid of that leader, right? That's a pretty obvious one, right? Uh, we believe in checks and balances. That's a fundamental moral good, we believe. It's part of what it means to actually have self-government in the West, to be able to check and balance against bad leaders. But you bring up a point, right, which is, you know, how do you, how do you fight back against Iran or Russia or China that can just wait it out? Um, the answer to your question uh, is exactly why the deep state was built and how they justified it, and it was used against us. So the, the, so the answer to your question, in the 1960s, we all complain about the deep state, but we never actually asked the question, why was the deep state created? Yeah, it was sort of control things and all this, but they weren't actually 
they weren't doing it in secret in the 60s. They said, listen, we're up against foreign adversaries that are there forever. We need to create a permanent bureaucracy in Langley, Virginia, that runs the Central Intelligence Agency, formerly OSS, and they'll always be there. Therefore, they'll be the ones that will actually be able to be sustained. I would only push back to your question in one regard. We kind of do have a permanent bureaucracy in our country. Right. We just have kind of different people that come in to try to manage it. Does that make sense? Where it's like we have we yeah, we have a new president, but the FBI doesn't change like DOJ doesn't change. The IRS doesn't change. Um, and look, I, I will say this, that, you know, <laughs> there's there's a, a, a temptation to be like, oh, yeah, a dictator could just fix these problems. They can wave a wand. I know that's not what you're saying at times. But um, I think that we need to do everything we possibly can to resist that, that separation of powers um, and believing that a single person should not have the dominance over the many, that the many need to rule the few, the few should not rule the many, um, is something that will actually allow the civilization to survive a lot longer than the Potemkin village of the Chinese Communist Party. So CCP or Saudi Arabia or Iran or Russia might be able to wait it out, but they're actually sitting on a much more... Um, I would say, a uh, destructive set of circumstances because I do not believe dictatorships are sustainable long-term. I don't. Um, I think they can be passed down, but eventually there'll be fault lines, divisions, civil war, and hopefully a citizen-led movement to displace them. So thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, good evening, Charlie. Uh, my name is Johnny, and I'm an MBA student at Cal State Fullerton. And uh, like many other students and conservatives here, uh, I believe this movement that we're starting uh, is created at the grassroots level, which in turn starts in the classroom. So my question to you is this. What do you feel is the biggest problem in the collegiate education system, and how do we fix this moving forward if we wish for our movement to continue to, to, continue to gain ground? Yeah, man. I mean, what the biggest problem with the collegiate education system is the collegiate education system. I mean, it's... It's top to bottom, rotten to the core. Uh, college is right for some people. It's not right for most people. It just isn't. It's a racket and a cartel for a lot of people. Um, I have a book coming out called The College Scam, where I put forward a 10-count indictment against the current state of college that I think that will blow you away. So, for example, you know, I'm not going to put you on the spot, but I just want you to think for a second. You know, what do you think the national graduation rate from college is? It's 59%. Raise your hand if you know someone that dropped out of college. Every hand goes up. 41% of people that go to college don't graduate. That's demoralizing. They leave with debt. They leave with less direction. Uh, they never should have gone to college in the first place. Now, that's only one part of it, not to mention the student loan burdens, right, where people are borrowing money they don't have to study things that don't matter, to find jobs that don't exist, to go into a job market where everything's hyperinflated, where that piece of paper means less and less and less. A vast majority of people going to college are not trying to get their MBA which is a great reason to go to college as long as it's not completely woke. But they're getting sociology degrees. They're getting degrees that don't exactly have um, a highly, um, let's say, uh, let's say a um, very competitive kind of standpoint to what that degree would be, especially where people are looking to hire right now. Um, we need more people in the muscular class in America. We need more plumbers, electricians, and welders, and police officers, and firefighters, and entrepreneurs. And we need to not demean them or diminish them. We need to elevate muscular labor in our country. If you ask me, we have way more than enough people that studied North African lesbian poetry, you know, in the last couple of years and that have, you know, that have this huge debt burden and we they don't really know where their their place is. So look, top to bottom, college is doing a lot of damage to our country. I wish that wasn't the case. I don't think it has to be the case. College can be awesome. Hillsdale College is a great example of that. If every college like Hillsdale College, I'd have a completely different opinion. I've spent time at Hillsdale College. I've got to know Dr. Larry Arn. You know what they try to do from day one? They tell you that you don't know everything, and there's something here at this college that's special, and you're going to go on a journey to discover it. They also say this. They say, we're going to complete the whole human being, the mind, body, and soul. We're going to read things that are ancient and beautiful and good, and you're going to really wrestle with the most important ideas and topics. That doesn't happen a lot at universities anymore. Instead, it's, hey... You have your own opinion of truth, who's to say what is good and beautiful, and kind of just go have fun along the way. So, look, not to mention, I just want to say this about college in general, is that for parents out there, just be very, you know, pray about this and be filled with wisdom. Uh, if, if you're pushing your child to go to college because of you, that's a bad reason. Most kids going to college uh, believe they, they don't want to be there. Now, you might say, oh, they don't know what's good for them. Okay, there might be an argument to that. 
But it's also them that's borrowing the money. Maybe it's not. Maybe you're paying for it. That's a different dynamic. But I, 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 at Berkeley yesterday, this one kid is $85,000 in student loan debt. I said, do you want to be here? I said, no, my parents are making me be here. I said, that's quite an operation there, right? Like, go borrow $85,000 in your name because your parents are making you do it. Like, that's, that's not good. It's not sustainable. So we need less people going to college. We need more people to start businesses. We need more entrepreneurs. We need more people to do things. Um, and we need more people to be filled with integrity and courage and character and less people to be filled with postmodern, secular, atheistic ideas where they, th they start questioning the most. I had a, w a woman yesterday at UC Berkeley came up to me at the table. She said, Charlie, we don't know what human beings are. We're just a collection of cells. And I said, only at a university campus could you be filled with something that is so unwise to spend so much time on something so fundamentally deranged as that question. And she really was wrestling with it. She said, there is no fundamental difference between a human, we call a human, and a goldfish. And I said, listen, I don't have a college degree. I didn't go to college. Goldfish, they don't write symphonies. And she's like, you're right. <laughs> Thanks for your question. I appreciate it. So I have a question that might be a little bit different. I wanted okay. to ask why you're a Christian. I'm a Christian. Um, it's true. Uh, it's Sunday is Easter. And so look, there's, we're all made in the image of God. Um, the universe that we live in right now was created by someone who loves us. And the Bible tells us this. The Bible has one author, 66 books of telling the story. And look, we're all, we're made in that image of God. And the gospel can be summarized in four words, three words, two words, and one word. Four words, Jesus took my place. Three words, him for me. Two words, substitutionary atonement. And one word, grace. Uh, we don't earn it. We don't uh, start to do a lot of good things to be able to have eternal life. Um, I'm a Christian because I had a collision course with Jesus Christ in fifth grade. Uh, changed my life, gave my life to the Lord. And every single year, it started to mean more to me. As I got older, I realized, like, wow, I'm broken. I am, you know, I'm, there's something not right with me. It's like, yeah, that's original sin. But Jesus is there to give us something we did not earn, to give us something we do not deserve, to be able to get back into true and real communion with the God who loves us. And it's true. Um, you look at the archaeological evidence, the evidence for the resurrection, the evidence through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in the book of Acts. You look at how there's never been an archaeological discovery that disproves the Bible. Um, the, all that things can be done with reason, but there's one final reason why I'm a Christian. Um, it's less because of this and more because of this. Which, When you start to open up your heart, and your soul, and all of a sudden have the humility that you're just kind of a speck in this massive cosmic creation, all of a sudden I think many people in this audience that might be a little skeptical, all of a sudden that Lord who does love you is going to all of a sudden come into your life in a way that you might not expect. And so celebrate that Easter, and if you haven't given your life to the Lord, he, he, want, he, he, he sent his son Jesus Christ for you for that. Thank you. Okay. Uh, this will be the final question, is that right, Mackenzie? Okay. Hi, Charlie. I'm running for a local school board here in Orange County. <laughs> Thank you. Um, when I get elected, what is the most precious... <laughs> when I get elected, what is the most pressing issue that I could focus on to make the biggest impact in our public schools? Well, first of all, um, God bless you for running, and thank you for your courage and your conviction. It's just awesome. So, first, uh, you'll be demonized, slandered, smeared. I just kind of went through all that, especially if you go on a school board. But no, we're going to have your back in more ways than one to be able to do the right thing and to stand with conviction. Um, so, look, there's a lot of different things that I think that are incredibly important uh, if you're on a school board. Um, number one, you've got to ask questions about textbooks, curriculum, appropriation of funding, um, to make sure that there's policies in place that schools will never be locked down again and making sure kids are not wearing masks. I, I, was, I was driving in Beverly Hills today, and I saw groups of children walking on the side of the street coming out of Notre Dame Academy in, right near Beverly Hills, all wearing masks outside. And that's nothing short of child abuse. It's child abuse to put a mask on a, on a child. It's bad for their development. It's bad for their spiritual development, bad for their linguistic development. Um, but the most important thing um, that you can get done as a school board is be a relentless hawk for transparency and accountability. 
You need to be the public sector teacher union's worst nightmare. You need to be asking questions they don't want asked. You need to follow the money. You need to find out whether or not they're teaching gender transition surgery nonsense to five, six, or seven-year-olds. And then you need to channel righteous indignation and not put up with their excuses, their delay tactics, their nonsensical one-liners like, oh, it's all about equity. No, it's not. It's not about equity. It's not about teaching children. You are grooming children to be something that they shouldn't be, and I'm not going to put up with it. So the most important thing is you need to have courage, which look you do have, but then you need to have a mission. Your mission is not to be liked. Your mission is not going to be like voted the most popular person in the school board. Your mission is to protect the innocence of children and lead them through truth and to create informed patriots. God bless you. Wow. Wow. <laughs> Charlie, like, ah, you are good. You are gifted. Let me just say you are, let me, let me just put it like that. You are gifted. Like, I just love the way he speaks, his word of encouragement, the way he talks to people, the way he encourages the college students, even the one that want to go into president and um, leaders in college, the way he speaks with them. Like, he's really, really good. The last guy, he was saying that even if you are going to be a president of um, the public um, school, college, you just have to know that not everybody will like you. So the most important thing that you just have to do the right thing at the right time. Always do good. And the other lady that was saying that she want to be, um, what, what is, uh, we are a Christian, what all about your Christian life? He said, yeah. You have to love God with all your heart, that he's a Christian, that he believed that God came to die for him. Jesus came to die for us. He's um when you when you open your heart for the Lord, he come into you, bless your soul, bless your spiritual life, bless everything about you. It's good and I'm a Christian too. It's good to be a Christian because you enjoy a lot beautiful beautiful things being a christian like i'm i'm excited that i'm a christian and i'm grateful to god for making me um accepting me as his um daughter <laughs> so the other guy that was also talking about um the other guy that was also talking about um the how will people see him when he's he's maybe maybe he want to speak your he want to speak his mind how will how will they, how will he feel how will he love ones feel if he's not going to hurt anyone to me i feel that when you are saying the gospel truth no matter who who is going to be around you who is going to be there i just want you to like say it this is speak the truth and to set you free so you don't just have to say let me just say it like this right to not hurt this one so no say it out bring out what it, it's because when you keep it within you your heart will keep bothering you so you just have to let it out let it out say your mind talk about it make sure that you do it so you'll be free you understand so charlie talks he, he said a lot of things a lot of things like like I, I really, I learned a lot from what he said today. I really learn a lot. So um, so I know that you too also learn a lot. So please comment below on everything, um, your your opinion about this talk show. Comment below and also comment on any video of Charlie you want us to react to. Comment below, like this video, subscribe to our YouTube channel, Anger Fashion Store. Fashion makes sense.